Hello everybody, welcome to Coyote Public Lectures. This is Arman from Coyote. I hope you can hear me. I, I hope you can see me well. Um, sorry for taking a little bit longer today. I had to set up a couple of things. I had to prepare a couple of things before we start. Um, and I think it's now right about time we start as we are... Um, I see a lot of stuff going on in the chat. Thank you, Steve. Uh, yeah, this was a very express lecture. <laughs> British humor at its best. <laughs> I hope all of you are doing fine. Um, <laughs> yes. So um, today we're going to talk about REST API development with Express.js. Um, we are, I think this is the, the, the fifth lecture. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Um, but we talked about Node.js, we talked about Git, and we talked about object-oriented programming. And now we're moving forward with a, um, a totally new concept, REST API development. There's a kind of a break in our journey. Uh, we jump from node application development or application development with JavaScript on the back end to something called REST APIs. And I'm going to start talking a lot about what REST APIs are and, and the best practices of doing them. And then we're going to jump into code. And sixth, okay, yeah, <laughs> thank you, Dennis. And next week we're gonna have a second session of um, of this, and we're gonna keep talking about REST APIs. So I hope to expand on our knowledge there um, next week as well. And today we're we're gonna do a brief intro to REST APIs and what we really, how we really approach building APIs. And let me start by by talking about what an API is and what REST is and um, different ways of building APIs and different ways of actually like talking to a, a backend. And all right, REST APIs and APIs in particular. API stands for Application Programming Interface, Programmable Interface. Um, what we do is we have an app that does something, some function. Think of um, of our usual example of a banking app, right? We have a banking application and this application can do some task for us. It can do, you know, it can open uh, a bank account. We can withdraw money, deposit money. And we're going to be building on, on top of that example today as well and, and next week as well. So we have this this application, right? And we want to talk to it. We want to be able to give it commands. And usually we have a web application or a mobile application to do that, right? You have, hopefully, you, the year is 2020 and your bank went digital, finally. And hopefully you have an app that shows you your, your bank account and you can interact with your account. Like you can um, deposit money, you can send money to, to someone else and so on. Um, but not only that, we, we don't only have a web page and we don't only have a mobile application. What we also have are devices like ATMs, right? That people use to deposit money or withdraw money from their accounts. So we have different machines, physical machines even, that let people interact with their application. I think PayPal also counts yes exactly that's johnny thanks thank you very much that's a very good um example of um another application talking to our bank account because what you do is you use paypal right and you use paypal to pay for stuff online and it kind of knows about your bank account so it's it's also kind of a protection layer in between you don't expose your bank account details and you just sign up and pay with paypal and then paypal knows how it should withdraw that money from your account. Um, all in all, we have this app that we developed on the back end. Um, that is one single app, one single app that allows you to keep track of your spendings and that allows you to open accounts and so on, which is great. But then we have all of these other tools. We have this, um, we have the, the web page, we have a, a mobile application, we have an ATM. We have a PayPal account. We have a um, 
I, I think it's a point of sale machine. I think it's called a, a POS machine. We have a POS machine that you can use with a card that we issue you. So you also have a card that's attached to our account. And when you swipe that card or when you insert it and write the pin, it also goes to your um, your bank account and kind of you know pay for whatever service you, you, you received. So all of these things need to talk to your bank account. Are, let's think about other, other scenarios. Are, they, are, are there more scenarios of, of a similar kind where we have other environments, other applications that get in, um, kind of like get in touch with our um, bank account and, and ask for money or, or they want to add money to it. I think there are other banks, right? They're transferring money. Um, there could be services like your, especially for example, if you're, if you're living in Germany, what happens is the um, electricity provider, for example, charges you, charges your, your bank account automatically. So um, you don't have to pay your bill every month, but you give them access to your bank account and they charge automatically. So Exactly, like Amazon, for example, you can also um, give Amazon the, the right to withdraw money from your, from your account. So how will these work? How are we going to make sure all of these transactions can go smoothly on a very well-defined protocol and we run into um, and, and they won't run into issues um, of like incompatibility or, um, you know, they, they use a certain programming language or they use a certain technology that um, may or may not support the, the platform that we're choosing for, um, for these transactions. Now, a very good way, a very standard way of building this functionality is building a standard API. An API is a, it could be anything. Anything could be an API. A library that you ship in the form of source code could be an API. A, an application that you develop could be an API. A web page that you have developed, a web service that you have developed could be an API. It just gives programmatic access to our application. Anything that gives programmatic access to our application is an API. So um, in this regard, today we're going to talk about REST APIs or RESTful web services. Um, but this is by no means the only way to build APIs. And this there, there's a lot of confusion about the, the name um, API and what it actually means and, and when you use an API and for what purpose. So hear me out when I say anything that gives you programmatic access to a piece of functionality is an API. I know that's a very broad term, but unfortunately that is um, the only true definition of, of an API. Anything that gives you programmatic access to an application, a business functionality, it doesn't have to be a single application even. Um, it could be a web of different applications. Um, in that regard, all of the different devices that I have mentioned before, like a, a post machine or, um, PayPal or, or anything else, they have programmatic access to your bank account. Obviously there are not real people running around and, you know, <laughs> whenever you swipe your credit card or your, um, debit card, there are no people running around and, oh, Arman swiped their card, let me rush in and transfer this, this amount of money. Um, that's not a manual operation, that's programmatic um, and that's actually automatic. And that happens over a standardized um, entry point, a standardized look, a standardized approach to um, that application. And that is what an API is. Now, again, we're going to talk about REST APIs today. There could be many different kinds of APIs. Um, you could build, again, APIs in the form of source code. You could build a voice interface. 
Um, so the only way to interact with that application is through voice. And that 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 could be its API. Um, but let's scope down a little bit. And exactly what we are trying to achieve here is networked applications. We have an application that lives on the internet. All right. We have our banking application that lives on the internet. And what we do is we give people programmatic access over the internet. Now, even this is a very broad scope and you could do many different kinds of APIs on top. Um, you could have a web sockets API, you could have a real time API. You, you, you don't have to have a rest API alone, but today we're going to talk about again, <laughs> rest APIs. Um, for example, you could have a very low level socket level interface and you could define your own standards of how to pass messages across. And that would be valid. That would totally, totally be valid um, as an API. You would just need to tell everybody that you have a custom API and this is the protocol um, they have to implement in order to talk to you. And they would have to follow that tradition. And now, as you probably all know, um, the majority of the internet works over a protocol called HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, right? Um, there is then, of course, HTTPS, which is the secure version, which uses certificates for, um, for encrypting the details and, and the data that's in flight. Um, but this protocol allows you to access any web page. It allows you to access any sort of resource that's out there, right? Imagine you're looking for, you're searching for something on Google. Um, you do it over HTTP. You type HTTP colon slash slash google.com and then you see a web page and that is your HTTP request to Google. Um, you fetch a document and then it has some JavaScript files, it has some CSS files, it has some images. For all of them, you are, or the browser in your name in the background um, is doing HTTP requests, all right? I'm not gonna go into the details of HTTP in this lecture. We're gonna talk about REST APIs and Express.js, but um, pretty much everything we do on the web is through this HTTP protocol. And then there are other protocols, again, like um, a, a, um, an RTC protocol for real-time communication. And then we have web sockets um, that we use for real-time communication. Again, um, they are also out of our scope. But um, the most straightforward way to build an API is therefore a technology that everybody knows that powers the entirety of the internet. That is HTTP. So REST APIs are therefore um, built on top of HTTP because we want everybody to be able to access our API and to be able to work with it. Um, and I would kind of argue that HTTP as a standardized protocol is really suited to building APIs. Again, APIs are programmatic interfaces to our application, right? Um, and if you have a networked application, as in our case, our bank app, um, if you build a set of operations like opening a, an account, um, depositing money and withdrawing money, right? These are all different actions that, that you can do in, um, in your bank. What we need to do is to give access to developers and therefore end users um, to be able to do these operations over the network. So far in our previous lectures, we had a bank account class um, and in code, we opened an account and withdrew money and so on. Um, and that was the programmatic interface in code. But of course, we're not going to give, maybe we will, but I don't think so. We're not going to give that access to to other people, other companies. What we're going to do is we're going to say, we have a URL. 
And through this URL, you can authenticate and you can send requests to me um, in the name of a person, in the name of a client. And then you can do, then you can have um, a certain access in into their bank account. So if you are PayPal and this person sold something and you received money in their name and you want to transfer them to their bank account, you need a deposit action, right? You have this URL, send some parameters to it, and then you're, you're going to be able to deposit some money into their accounts. This is, this is what we're basically trying to say. We have an application, a networked application that lives on the internet, and we want to give people programmatic access to, um, to our application, to, to the bank accounts. All right, so we said HTTP is the protocol of choice because it is very simple. It is text-based. A lot of people know it. Literally, <laughs> the entire internet runs on it, so why not? Um, but the question is, is every API built on top of HTTP a REST API? What is REST anyway? We defined API, but we didn't define REST. Um, now, I'm not going to go a lot into the details of um, the academic background of, of REST or RESTful services. REST is an architectural style of building consistent standard APIs that are networked. Um, it gives you a kind of a framework to work with, kind of some best practices, approaches, and limitations to work with, so that the, um, the apps that you build is understandable, people can work with them, and in a very um, intuitive way, and they, they, they kind of know what they should get. They kind of have a set of expectations of any REST API. So it's kind of a standard way of building HTTP APIs. Um, we're going to talk about everything that is there to know about REST API in this lecture and in the next. Um, but I think it's good to know that it came out from the academia. It didn't start out as an industry effort. Um, REST APIs is actually a, a PhD thesis. I think um, came up around the year 2000 and then it, it caught attention because like it was actually an amazing look into building APIs. So before that, didn't we have network applications? Of course we did. We had a lot of network applications. Um, we already had online banks and so on, for example, even at that level like of like transferring money, which has to be really um, standardized and there is no um, tolerance for errors, for example. We had APIs, of course, but we had custom protocols. And it was very, very difficult to understand those protocols because pretty much every application out there defined its own protocol. And this is what I'm um, trying to tell you when I say REST brings a certain structure, a certain standards that makes it easy for everyone to reason about. They kind of know what to expect. They kind of know how to work with this standard um, because it's basically, it's a, it's a very defined structure or and, and way of doing APIs. Um, again, before this, what we did was every, <laughs> Johnny, yeah, um, there's, a, there's a comment in the chat that says, I don't even want to know how the software of our company looked before REST APIs. Um, and as a person having seen those times, I can say it wasn't fun. <laughs> You know, you are asked to build an application. You're asked to build a networked application that, that is supposed to talk to five different vendors. And imagine the situation where all those five vendors have different APIs and different protocols. They are using TCP sockets, raw TCP sockets, and there's a lot of handshake you have to do. Um, how do you authenticate yourself? 
how do you present a resource, how are the actions programmed. Um, the industry really struggled to come up with a model of sharing functionality or invoking functionality in different applications over the network um, before we kind of settled on, on REST. Right now, I'm, I kind of feel very fortunate that we have an approach like REST that we're able to build APIs, which is super straightforward. And you know, when we start to talk about it, you're gonna be like, are you sure this is it? This doesn't sound like anything real. Like this is very simple. And as with anything in software, the simpler it is, the better. And the, the best solutions are the most simple ones. Um, I think this is something that has to stick with you um, through the end of your career. What we're trying to do, oh yeah, Roy Fielding, yes. Um, what we're trying to do is, in your careers, when you wanna um, advance and, and become more senior and, and maybe architects, the key to, to those levels is not to be able to write more complicated software. It's actually the opposite. It's being able to tackle really complex scenarios and really complex applications with very, very simple steps and very simple approaches in code. Um, if you can make that work um, in a maintainable way that you know tens or maybe even hundreds of people can, can work on, then that is good architecture. And then that means that you know how to build applications um, just like a, a true senior, <laughs> just like a boss. So, um, okay, back to, back to APIs. This is why we need something very simple because right now every app you build is networked. Um, even if you build a mobile app, that's a hundred billion trillion dollar industry. Uh, even if you build games, of course you can have um, single player games, but you know, most of the games, especially when they wanna make money, they go for um, multiplayer games. So what, what happens here is as the internet becomes more prevalent in our lives, we get more and more networked. So all the applications kind of feel the need to interoperate and rest apis is a um is a brilliant way of, of doing this so what is rest rest stands for representational state transfer now this term on its own is not very well understood by many people representational state transfer. What is representation? What is state? What do we transfer? Um, the answer to all of these are actually in um, Roy Fielding's thesis that introduced um, the, um, the concept of REST APIs to us. But um, basically what happens there is we have resources that we want to operate on. We have certain actions that we want to do. And in these actions, we change the state of those resources from state A to state B. And we do this via URLs. We use URLs to do that. And we also use certain verbs, HTTP verbs, HTTP um, actions to, to do that. We're gonna talk um, about this in a little bit with real examples and I'm gonna talk about Express.js, which is a web server for Node.js and we're gonna talk about building REST API with Express. Um, but the most important thing you need to understand in a REST API is there's a concept of a resource everything happens on a resource. And in fact, if you look at um, the, um, if you look at a URL, what is R in URL? That is the resource. A URL is a universal resource locator where it shows, each URL shows you the, um, the address of a, 
unique resource or it should um, again we're gonna talk about the um, the exact details in a, in a little bit so what you do in rest is you represent your resources as URLs with URLs so you assign a unique URL to each resource you have in your application and then you have some verbs like post get put patch delete um, you use these verbs to operate on these resources okay um, a URL only shows resources a URL indicates you in the direction of a resource this is going to come up uh, later in our discussion it's really important to make that distinction a URL doesn't tell you anything else it only tells you where a resource is located um, and then I said you need actions right you you want to change the state of those um, objects so what you need is another way another way to tell the rest api or, or the api or, or that application that you're talking to that you want to do a certain action you want to create open a bank account you want to close a bank account right these are different actions where do you indicate this in um, in your request? A lot of people think that it's it's a great idea to put it in the URL, like awesomebank.com slash account slash open. Should open a new account. Um, and awesomebank.com slash account slash your account ID slash close should close an account right um i'm sure you might have seen some some urls like this unfortunately this is not a good way of building rest apis because the verb the action that you want to do on that resource is in the url that's not a um a good locator that's not locating anything like there, there's no resource called close there's no resource called open so that doesn't work that's actually not a restful architecture that's not a restful approach um, and by restful i mean any application that looks like rest that looks like they are um kind of like acting in 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 the rest rest uh, architectural style um exactly um johnny the amount of times we have the same url but slash new for creating at the end is way too large yes unfortunately this is um this is one of the this is i think this is standard in, in ruby on rails um it it's not a not a good idea it's not a good idea it's it might be okay to show it to the client, the end user, the, the, the web browser. But if you're making a post request to the slash new to create a new resource, um, that's not a good idea at all, unfortunately. Um, we might talk about how to structure the URLs of client applications to be most effective um restful and you know in a, in a more um standardized way it it probably would be a, a different lecture but coming up with a url scheme for your entire application is very difficult um especially so that you're bound by your decisions once you're online with a url it's very very difficult to change it um, because you have to deal with redirects and so on it's it's not that easy so Coming up with URLs is maybe the most important aspect of designing a REST API. And the second part is designing the verbs to use. Like when you are opening a new, and again, we're going to talk more about this um, in, in this lecture. When you're opening a new account, that's a creation process. When you're closing an account, that's another request that you're doing to the backend, but that's a 
removing removal that's uh you're destroying your resource there there was an account and you're removing that account so that's a fundamentally semantically that's a different action you cannot use the same action that you used for creating an account that just doesn't make any sense at all um and in rest or restful apis we have very well thought out standards for um how to do these things and if you kind of follow the rules if you follow rest architectural style um, you end up with a very consistent application and you will notice that you don't have to write extensive documentation maybe most of you weren't lucky enough to experience this but you know whenever you had to build a networked application for an enterprise um, in late 90s or early early 2000s it came with a very thick book of documentation that tells you this is the request that you have to make to get this um, response and this response allows you to do this this and that and for that you need to prepare another request like this it's all custom hundreds of pages just to build um, programmatic just to build a programmatic interface to your application that is um, accessible over the network so um, right now we don't need those in fact, so much so that we, we stopped doing documentation of our APIs almost altogether. Um, we, we just have a couple of comments and a couple of examples and everybody knows how, how REST works, like how URLs and how these HTTP words work. So <laughs> yeah, worse, it doesn't come with any documentation at all. And then you have no idea because there is no standard. You, you don't say, well, this is a resource i know how to access it this is another resource and therefore it should be accessible in the same way and you'll be wrong um, so this is basically what kind of rest gives us it allows us to change the state of resources from one state to another state um, over http it's a set of standards to um, basically allow this functionality there are a lot of technical details academic details about how to build um, about how to build rest apis and we're gonna touch base on them as we move along but i want to keep this really simple um, and i'm I, I want to show you how to build a rest api with express.js and how we um, kind of interact with it how we use it and i'm going to talk about a couple of differences of, of building those um, resources, IDs, and so on and so forth. Um, before we start, let me know if you have any questions or comments down in the chat below, and I'm going to start sharing my screen, and we're going to um, build a, um, a REST API together with Express.js. Um, <laughs> All right. Hi, Ege. How are you? Now, before we start, let me tell you this. Express.js is an amazing web server in Node. I love using it. I, I'm using it for, well, basically since the day it came about to be. Uh, probably for 10 years, 9 years, I guess, I'm using Node.js. Um, I haven't used a different web framework um, I wrote my own a couple of times in the very early days, 2011 and 12. Um, but I'm mainly using Express.js for anything, for building any backend application, not only REST APIs, for, uh, but real fully full-fledged backend applications as well. Um, it is easy to use. It is very easy to use. It has a very small surface area. It's very easy to learn, therefore, um, I recommend Express.js to all my clients and all my students as well. Um, there are a lot of um, there are a lot of different frameworks that you can use, but and you know more recent ones that are really hyped and that got a lot of attention. I think the the most important part they are lacking is clarity and simplicity. So, um, yeah, 
<laughs> in index.js there are a couple of stuff that's like a boilerplate joining your right um but today we're going to also talk a little bit about best practice of express and how you should kind of structure your express app and we're going to build on top of that um next week but um Express is not only for REST APIs. It's a very flexible web application framework for backend, and it is really extensible. You can add anything you want. It's very easy to, to build plugins and then source certain functionality and libraries for it. Um, today, we're going to use it only for REST APIs. It also allows you to, of course, um, build... Um, web pages as well you know real web applications but again we're not gonna look into um that aspect today or or next week so there are many ways of using express i'm going to use the simplest way and um, i'm going to show a very very quick demo on how you can set up express and um, and start to be to be productive with it um last thing before we start there are many different ways of building express applications there are many different ways of building um rest api with express we are going to focus on one of the most simplest ones and i recommend to keep it as simple as possible of course um, but out in the wild you're going to see that people are using express um, or other frameworks in various ways wild ways um, and again not every api you build with express means it's a rest api it just means an api on top of http it's using the http protocol um, but it's it doesn't have to be a rest api and i'm going to show you a couple of examples about that as well all right now let me switch to my screen yeah Great, I think, great, I think you can see my screen right now. Um, I am in my public lectures folder. This is our repository for the, for all the source code um, that we wrote in our public lectures. Feel free to check it out, it's on GitHub. And I'm going to create a, um, a new folder here for week five or lecture five, let's say, and we're going to um, build our API inside. Okay, so first things first, Express has a really nice documentation that you can get started with. It's expressjs.com and um, you can see it here, expressjs.com. It very simple. There's a new version, um, Express 5.0 alpha. Um, which is slightly different than Express 4, which is the current stable version. We're going to use Express 4 um, today. This is how you install it, npm install Express. You actually don't need save because save is the default action right now. This is um, an easy way to get started with Express, but I think it's not the best way. It is very simple to get started, but um, you need a lot of configuration, manual configuration, and I don't like to do them um, on my own. What I do is, um, there is a, another way of working with Ex Express, that is the Express application generator. Um, what this does is it gives you a very easy way to start building your application. It gives you a scaffold um, to start building your applications. And this is what I'm going to use because Express generator generates an Express project that is really, um, fine-tuned for um, starting immediately otherwise you have to install additional libraries uh, i just don't like it so what we're gonna do here is to do npm install minus g express generator and that will install express generator globally into my um, my computer so that i can use express in the future you don't have to do that. You can also do MPX. I don't, I'm not going to go into the details of MPX versus NPM. If you're interested in it, you can Google it. Um, it allows you not to install it on your computer, but to fetch it every time you run the command um, so that you have the latest copy at all times. 
So I'm going to use npm install minus g express generator. And of course, I also did it a couple of times before. That's why it was very, uh, very simple and, and fast for me. You might want to follow along and code along. So um, feel free to do that. I just do npm install minus g express generator. And then the next command here is express view pug my app and um, and the rest will follow. This is basically the only command that I'm going to use to generate a fully fledged express application. Express dash dash view equals pug my app. And I think I'm going to call it five dash um, rest API or something. So express dash dash view equals pug. Um, I'm going to talk about this in a little bit. You don't have to type it. You can, you can just say express um, and the folder name five rest APIs. Okay. It created a new folder for me. So let me go there. And I'm going to do npm install. Basically, it's it, the commands are here. It says change directory, install dependencies, and then run the app. There you have it. We have installed the dependencies. And then the command to run it is debug equals five rest apis npm start i'm just copying and and pasting it okay it says it's five rest api server is listening on port 3000 nothing else that's great the command to run it was node bin slash www before we have a look at the um, the output of, of that server, let's see what's in our folder here. We have a folder called bin that has one single file called www. Um, this is basically the entry point to our application. This is what you type to start your application. You will remember from our introduction to Node.js classes that we had npm start. That was a standard way of starting applications and um, it would be in it will be defined in package json um, and if, if you look at that start script it's running this bin www so this is actually something that you can run this is a runnable all right um, what it does is it creates an http server for us okay and it starts listening on a certain port and by default, that port is 3000, as you can see here. So it's it starts to listen on port 3000. Um, there are a lot of boilerplate here that you would have to write on your own that Express Generator gives us. So I just love it. Um, what happens in terms of um, errors? What happens in, in like when you have a port, when um, you, you start listening to, to that server? You don't need to deal with um, any any of these. Uh, okay. Well, it happened again. My. Okay. No, I'm here. All right. My iPad told me that the the broadcast is over, but I think we're all here, all right? I hope you can hear me. I, I opened this stream again. I think, I hope you're all here. Are you? <laughs> Give me a thumbs up. All right. Some of you are here at least. All right. I'm going to continue. I don't know why this happens all the time, but it 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 is it does. I sad, really sad. <laughs> no, please don't troll me. <laughs> it's not funny. Um all right. The most important thing here is, as the first line, this is importing a file called app.js, okay? It's this little file over here, app.js. This is where you instantiate Express and where you create your Express application. So this www file takes that application, puts it in an HTTP server and serves that application, if you will. So your app.js does not know anything about where it's created, where it's run. Um, there are a lot of boilerplate here that you would have to do on your own. 
um, as Johnny said, he built a kind of a wrapper around this so that you don't have to build these parts. You will probably need to add some stuff here in the future. I'm not going to go into the details of what each um, of these lines do, but it um, it's actually important to kind of know what all of these are. I know there are many. Um, it, it looks very cryptic. It's 40 lines of cryptic code. Um, there's nothing you can reason about. It's all keywords like express JSON, express URL encoded, but um, it will really help you if you kind of dig through what each of these mean and if you Google them. The most, most important bit for us here is app.use. This is a, a very um, useful function, as in the name, um, that allows us to extend the functionality of our Express application. And in this case, we are using it to define how we're going to respond to certain requests that are coming into our application. What we do here is, um, Burak asks if we can edit the www file. It is bad practice. I wouldn't recommend editing it because if you want to upgrade your Express um, application, you would probably just want to replace this www file entirely. Uh, but if you want to update it, sure, just make sure your changes are really small. Uh, if possible, do your changes somewhere else. Um, I tend to keep this file as it is generated. Um, because it, it, it's also mostly because people just overlook this www file. It's not a place where people would expect to see stuff. So um, I would just, you know, be careful about this, about changing this. It's unexpected to see custom code here. Okay, so um, the most important part for us, especially today here, is how we indicate our URLs and how we define what happens in uh, what, what happens when a user browses to a, a URL. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, so we say for every request that is coming to slash, use a module called index router. It, it's here. Use a module called index router. It's defined up top. Okay. And then for every request that is coming to slash users, use the users router. All right. That's another module um, defined up top. So apparently our application has kind of like two top URLs defined. There's the um, localhost 3000 slash, and then there's localhost 3000 slash users is um, what we define. Let's go to our roots. So what we do here is in these modules, we create something called a, a router. Okay. In fact, we then export it. And this is what we import here. This is the index router. This is the users router. So what this does is it kind of routes the incoming request to a function. Right now here we do rest.render. Okay. Um, it's another function that's available on the response object. So each um, we call these root handlers. Each root handler has some parameters. It's they either have a request, they have a response. You can see the types here. Um, they have the request, a response, and a next function. We're not going to talk about the next function today. Uh, we're going to do it next week. But what we say here, if you want to get the slash URL, we're going to render the index view to you. Okay. Um, and you have the documentation here, render view with the given options and an optional callback function. Um, the options here, we're, we're just rendering express as the title. So let's go back to our browser. Let's refresh the page. And this is what we see express. Welcome to express. This is what we are rendering here. Okay. Um, welcome to Coyote express lecture. Let's change the title. Let's save it and 
refresh here, it doesn't change. Why doesn't it change? What could have gone wrong? Remember, I introduced a module called Nodemon to, yes, exactly, to be able to follow these changes um, and restart your applications when, um, when a change occurs. And of course, by default, um, unfortunately, Express doesn't come with Nodemon built in. So we kind of have to change it. Okay. So I'm going to do that right now. Uh, we have the start script and then I'm going to have a dev script. This is again, very common. And I'm just going to do Nodemon bin www, but there's no Nodemon right now. So I will do npm install Nodemon. And I'm going to actually put a minus D here to save it as a development dependency because I don't want to, I don't want Nodemon to end up in production. It's my, it's only for my local development. So uh, I want it to sh show up as a development dependency. Here it is. Now I think I can do npm um, run dev. Okay. And then I have Nodemon and um, let me go back to index.js. Let me open Safari. We have the updated title and, you know, let me remove this word here, save it again. It restarts. I refresh and I see the updated version. Perfect. Um, so we are able to work with Nodemon right now. But if you noticed, we ran our application, but we don't have the logs that we had before. Like it was running, um, listening on port 3000. We don't have it. This is because we used a different command when we run our application and it was this debug five rest APIs and NPM start. So this is something I'm going to add to my um, dev script and I will hope that it's going to work. It may or may not work. Let's see, npm run dev. It worked perfectly. Great, so now I also have some debug messages coming from Express. And now let's go back and uh, refresh again. Great, this is an HTML that I'm rendering as part of my application. It's not a REST API yet. So in this index router, you see when we, when someone asks for this home page, we render the index view. Okay. Now let's look at the user's router. It is doing a similar thing. Um, it has given me a root handler, which is great. Um, and it's also listening to slash. So these look almost identical and it says respond, uh, respond with a resource, right? Um, how does that work? What is the URL for this? The URL for this is localhost 3000 slash users. Okay. Um, don't forget in our app.js, we were using slash users for this router. All right. So anything you see in, um, any URL you see in this users.js actually has this slash users coming before it. So this is equivalent to um, having this. It's almost like there's a hidden slash users that is defined by, by this URL over here. All right. So let's keep it as slash right now. Um, let's go to localhost 3000 slash users. There you go. We're now on localhost 3000 slash users. Um, what we see here is this string that I said that I typed here, respond with a resource. So I can also type hello world and refresh and I'm going to see hello world. So whatever you type here appears here. Perfect. 
Look at the URL, 3000 slash users, okay? Now, perfect. The comment here is get users listing. So this tells you that this should return a list of users, all right? And the way you do that is by using the send method on the response object that's coming in as a parameter. You do response.send, hello world. Um, you could do user1 and user2 and user3, all right? And if you refresh, you kindly, gently get uh, user1, user2, user3, which is, of course, not a real list. <laughs> We're going to get to that part. Before we move on, let me show you this index because I think we glossed over that detail. It's not the, the topic of this lecture, but I know you're wondering what that index is. It is called a view, all right? It is basically a piece of HTML that has some parameters, title, that we pass from um, our root handler. And basically, this, this language is called pug, and it's converted into HTML when we're rendering it. You see this index.pug is extending the layout, okay? And layout is actually what talks about the um, HTML, the head, the title, see the title goes here, and then there's the body, and you have a content block, and in your index pug, you kind of say, okay, the, um, the content block should show these details. So there's an H1, and then there's the, uh, the paragraph, Kyoto Lecture, welcome to Kyoto Lecture. And you see the layout also includes a style sheet, style CSS, that is under the public folder style sheets here. All right, this is a very simple way to build web applications. You can build your entire web application just using um, pug views in Express, and it would be um, a legitimate application, it would work. Yes, pug is a template engine, exactly. It's like Mustache or Handlebars or EJS, any other template engine that, that you can think of. Um, yeah, maybe we can do that next week, Johnny. It's, it's not um, part of REST APIs because even though the actual way of showing displaying data in a REST API is not defined, we're going to use um, the JSON standard. We're going to... Um, all of the responses that we do will be in, in JSON, all right? So here, um, let me define a list of users here. Very crudely, I'm saying name Arman and um, I don't know, occupation, software engineer, okay? This is a user. Let me create another user named Steve. Occupation. Um, Steve, what was your occupation at Coyote? <laughs> Chief of learning. I think it was something like this. <laughs> okay, now we have a list of users, all right? Um, let me return this list of users. I just simply do rest.send users. Of course, in a real application, you would fetch the list of users from a database. Um, for now, let's let's say that um, this is coming from a local array. And if you refresh here, you see Arman, occupation, software engineer, Steve, occupation, chief of learning. Um, and you can do whatever you want with this on the front end. Um, now, a person who receives this information can do anything they want with this um, with this piece of JSON. Um, basically, we're returning a JavaScript object. Great. Now, let me show you um, another way of working with these resources. Right now, in my application, I'm getting a list of users, and the root is localhost 3000. That's my app slash users, right? The operation that I'm running here, the HTTP action that I'm running here is get. I'm doing get users, get slash users, okay? 
And this basically um, gives me the list of users in the system. The URL here, users, shows a resource. The list of users is a resource, and I'm getting it through the action get and then the URL slash users. All right, how do I get a single user? I just want to fetch Armand or Steve with an ID. For that, I need to write another call here, router.get slash. Um, and let's say, let's fetch the user, the first user with index zero, okay? I do, um, let me write an error function, request response and next. And I do rest.send um, users zero, okay? I'm returning the first user. I save it, I go back, I refresh, this is my users. And now let me um, open a new tab and go to the, um, the first user. Okay, this is users slash zero. And this gives me the first user in the database, all right? What if I want to fetch the second user? What if I want to fetch Steve? How would that work? For example, I type users slash one to the URL but it tells me it's not found. I know there's a there's another user, Steve. How do I get it? I could just as well do this. <laughs> yeah, then that's funny, Jenny. Yes, exactly. That's how you should do that. <laughs> I could just as well do this slash one and get users. And if I refresh, I see Steve. Um, this is the list of users, this is Steve, and this is Armand. But, of course, this doesn't scale, right? This doesn't work at all. You need to make this parametric. Whatever comes after slash, I declare it as the ID, okay? And then I return request params id i return the user based on chief bottle top washer yes exactly chief bottle top washer yes that's what steve is thank you steve <laughs> so what i do is i make this parametric i take this um yeah i can i can call it index. I take this from the URL, I define this index in the URL, and then I use that to find the actual user that I'm looking for, and then I'm returning that user, all right? And now, um, of course, we updated Steve, and you see I have one single root handler, but I'm able to get however many users I have. So let me add another user, name Miri, occupation, um, head of mobile engineering, okay? And I don't change my code at all. I go to the URL and type two, and I end up with Miri's details. Steve, Armand, and Miri. So this is how I make it parametric. Now, it's all great, um, but of course, um, in a real application, you just don't have um, you just don't have the indexes of, of items in the array. What we do have, though, is individual identifiers in in each of these users so um, what 
we sh ideally should have is an ID for this user, um, like user one, okay? Another ID for this user, user two, another ID for this user, user three. Let's hard code them for now. And here, instead of an index in the array, you would receive an ID. And this is how you would kind of um, find that user, all right? That's actually what we're gonna do. Instead of returning the user with an index, we're gonna find a specific user by using an array method called find, users.find. We're trying to find the user whose ID matches the incoming ID, rec params ID, okay? And we're sending it back to the client. You refresh, users two gives you nothing because we don't have um, a user with ID two right now. But if I type, so I type user one and what you get here is the detail of user one. And then you can do user two and get the details of user two, all right? This is how we use IDs. And these would be unique IDs. We're gonna cover that next week. Um, this, this would be unique IDs in our database. That's how we get these users. Before we conclude this lecture, I wanna show you one more thing. I think I do this every week. <laughs> I'm gonna show you one more thing. How do we um, create a new user? I'm gonna give you the answer next week, but um, remember, I told you URLs define resources. And then there's another thing, the action, the verb that you want to do, right? Get is the verb that we have. That's an HTTP action that we use to retrieve resources. But then there's another action called post, which is used to create resources. All right. So what we will do next week is we will do router.post and we're gonna use slash as the URL because we want to create a new user altogether. Um, the list is, the, the resource is users and we want to post a new user to that list of users. So we don't know the ID, for example, um, of a user that we're gonna create that will be given to us automatically uh, by the database. So I do um, post slash rec res and next. And here I'm going to have a user in, um, I'm going to have a user inside the request body, something um, called a request body. And I'm going to type users push something like this, rec.body. Take the user from um, the request and create a new user, save it in our database, in our users array. And so that that user will be accessible um, from, from our get request. But this is like a cliffhanger. Uh, I'm gonna show you how this works and why this works, what RecBuddy is next week in the next episode of Kairos Software Engineering Public Lectures. The next episode will be again on REST APIs. We're gonna talk about all of the different actions that you need to do. We're gonna talk about different URLs and we're gonna add these things um, to our previous application of banking bank accounts and we're gonna be able to create open accounts, um, withdraw money, deposit money. Um, it's gonna be a full live lecture of coding, an entire hour of coding. So um, I'm gonna leave it here. And um, you know, next week we're gonna go back to coding. And you know, maybe you want to experiment with this. Maybe you want to have a look at the, the week four codes and, and kind of like 
try to match them up uh, with the REST API. And next week, we're going to talk about how to build a realistic looking banking application with a REST API with Express.js. We're going to talk about so many things next week. I hope you liked it. I hope the um, lecture was useful. I just wanted to give you a brief intro to Express.js. And <laughs> yeah, we're going to take over N26 in Germany. <laughs> all right, folks, um, this was lovely to have all of you here. Again, Coyotev is a school of software engineering that teaches you all the fundamentals you need to become a great software engineer in 2020 and beyond. So make sure to check out Coyotev.com for our upcoming cohorts. Um, subscribe to our YouTube channel, hit the bell button so that you get notified of the next lecture and all the lectures that will come afterwards because every Thursday uh, we have a new broadcast. Thank you for watching and I will see you next week. Bye-bye.